Good afternoon and welcome to Live at the Museum. My name is Penny Vale and I'm from our Lifelong Learning team. I'm joined this afternoon by conservator Natalie Eisen and curator Libby Stewart. Before we get into today's program, I'd like to start as always with an acknowledgement of country. We're filming today on the lands of the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any and all First Nations people who are present or watching via the live stream. Today's program is After the Flames, Fire and Conservation. It's also the first time that we are streaming out to Facebook Live as well as our regular YouTube audience. So to those of you joining us on Facebook for the first time, welcome aboard. Uh, I'm going to reintroduce our presenters. Uh, so first up, Libby, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience and telling them a little bit about yourself and where you fit into the museum? Sure, Penny. My name's Libby Stewart. I'm a senior curator here at the museum and I manage the Curatorial Centre on Defining Moments in Australian History. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Libby. Uh, and Natalie. Hi, my name's Natalie Eisen and I'm an objects conservator at the National Museum. Uh, I work on objects and our collection items and put them on display, look after them in the store and send them out on tour. It's wonderful to have you both here today. So uh, for those of you who haven't tuned in before, please do plug your questions in as soon as you have them. Don't wait until the video has finished. We have a short pre-record that we will go to in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, please note that this footage shows uh, images of the recent bushfires and their aftermath that some viewers may find distressing. It was filmed on site at our Mitchell repository. And because of the nature of fire affected objects, you'll see that both Libby and Natalie are wearing uh, safety masks and gloves in the pre-record. Thank you. I'm sitting here today in the National Museum's Conservation Lab and I'm here because I'm talking about bushfire collection objects. The National Museum has collected bushfire objects for many, many years. Bushfire, as we know, it's a perennial part of the Australian summer. Many Australians are affected by bushfire every year and the fires of 2019 and 2020 were the most devastating that the country has ever seen. So the first collection I'm going to talk about today is the um, public phone box that stood in the main street of the New South Wales south coast town of Cabago. Now the phone box was the only public payphone in the main street of Cabago when it was hit by really devastating bushfire that swept right through the main street of the town on New Year's Eve in 2019. It's really quite a remarkable object because it enables us to do a number of things. We're able to talk about communication and what happens when a town like Cabago um, is completely cut off from the rest of the world. This is the only public pay phone. It was decommissioned very quickly by fire. Mobile phone towers were also burnt out. The roads in and out of the town, the Princess Highway, were blocked by fallen trees. People who had uh, family members who, from Cabago who had gone uh, closer to the coast, uh, to Bermagui for safety, um, but had other family members stay in the town to fight fires, for days didn't know if their family members were safe because they just couldn't get through and there was no way to communicate. So that's a really important story about how um, communities rally together, how they, how they get through, how they survive, but also the very difficult conditions that they have to face. On a later visit to the Cabago area, I went to visit a pottery studio owned by a guy called Daniel Lafferty. But sadly, during the fire that went through Cabago, 
he had to make the very difficult decision to either save his studio or save his house. He couldn't save both. And they could tell how hot those fires were when they came through because this piece, which was um, in, a, in a storage area, the glaze has melted. It's then rolled around in the ash and the various debris from the fire, and then it's hardened up again so that you can see these burnt areas. The ash is actually now an integral part of the piece itself. But it's also very much a story of resilience and hope, which is something we want to do with these bushfire objects, is talk about how people cope, how communities pull together, as they did in Daniel's case. He was able to crowdfund and he's still working very hard to rebuild his studio. Today I'm going to talk to you about some of the objects that we've got in our collection that I find really interesting. These objects in front of me have been in two different areas that have both been affected by fire. So this object here is a teacup that was on Mount Stromlo in the 2003 Canberra bushfires. And the objects in front of me here and behind me in the fume cupboard, they are from the 2009 Black Saturday fires in Marysville. Now, you can see from some of these objects that they are a variety of different materials. The teacup, which is um, a ceramic, but it also has melted aluminium from the roof of the observatory that has dripped onto the handle and around the top of the teacup. And we've got a food steamer here, which is rusted metal with glass and ash and paint, and it's all con combined into this one object. Behind me, we have a dish that is um, made of ceramic and with the glass lid just melted inside it, and it's also full of ash and debris. So we need to be aware of the kind of risks that are involved in displaying objects that are quite fragile and also made of a different kind of chemical composition now. For these objects, which have been in fire affected areas, we can't guarantee that the soot that's on them isn't hazardous. So it could contain things like asbestos, lead, chemicals. It also could contain, if there's been water involved in putting out the fire, it could contain mould. Now, you can see from my mask and gloves and lab coat that we're still aware that that might be a hazard. We're about to put these objects on display and in order to do that, conservation and registration and curatorial all discuss the risks associated with putting objects on display in general, but specifically for this one, we've done a risk assessment around putting fire damage material on display. This teacup was from the 2003 Canberra bushfires and was from Mount Stromlo. So it's got some ash that's loose and it has the risk of becoming airborne and therefore an inhalation hazard, or it could fall out and be lost. And because this is part of the object's story now, we don't want to lose it. So we performed some tests and we determined that an ultrasonic mist of gelatin would be the best thing to consolidate the ash with. Now an ultrasonic mist is a very, very fine particle mist and that would ensure that instead of it looking like we painted on something to consolidate the ash and have the ash like a smear in the bottom of the cup or a really big clump, it's just, it's made to just fall in between the particles of ash and therefore make the ash still look like it's crumbly and fluffy, but the risk of it becoming airborne is a lot less. This dish, it has, its lid has been melted inside it with the heat of the fire and it's also full of fragments of ash and paint. And this logo on the front has changed in colour. And it just shows how these materials can change due to the amount of heat that they've sustained. That also makes me think quite a lot of the Cabago payphone and the way that that plastic in that payphone has reacted with the heat. So that dome that is orange on top of it that has melted into ribbons because of the amount of heat that that phone sustained. And the hand receiver on that phone is a different plastic again. And the wiring on the inside of the phone 
and all of the circuitry on the inside of the phone, plus the metal and the enamel on that, they're all different materials and they all will have changed because of their interaction with heat. So that's something else that we have to consider in conservation about how things have changed and the fact that they're not the same as objects that look the same but haven't been through a fire. Thank you both for uh, joining us in the technical lab at our Mitchell repository. Uh, Libby, can I ask, when did you visit Cabago and uh, what did you have to think about before visiting such a fire affected community? Yeah, it's a good question. I first went down to Cabago, which is on the southeast coast of New South Wales, uh, with a team from the museum in uh, February this year. So it was about six weeks after the town had been hit by really bad bushfires on New Year's Eve in 2019. Uh, the fires had gone through the main street and burnt a number of beautiful historic buildings, as well as um, the local payphone. Uh, that stood in the main street and we wanted to go down for a few reasons. We'd been talking to Telstra about possibly acquiring the payphone because it was decommissioned very early in the bushfires when it was burned as you saw in the video. Um, and we wanted to talk to people about how they felt about that, about taking um, that object away from the town and, and to the museum into our collection. But we also wanted to film some of the regrowth which was already happening around the town, there'd been some rain. Um, and we also wanted to, I guess, offer um, our support and, and just listen to, to people in the town to find out how they were feeling. So I guess the things that we had to take into account were um, knowing that we were going into an environment where people were very stressed and they'd been um, traumatised and um, being willing to be open to listen to the stories and to, to hear, hear them and, and um, understand what it was you know, that, that we could help them with. Um, if, if anything. Um, and also we needed to look after ourselves, of course, because um, you can um, take on that trauma as well. So there are a number of things to be really wary of when you're going into um, a, a fire affected community like Bargo. Um, following on from that, how do you connect with fire affected communities to capture stories and objects? Mm. It's really important before you go into a community like Cabago and um, another one that I've also visited, um, Tumbarumba up in the, the mountains, to make contact before you go and to, to speak to people on the ground so that you can explain what it is that you're going there for, um, why you're interested in or what are the stories that you're interested in collecting and, and and also asking how um, we from the museum can help in that community. So in the case of Cabago, I made contact with a lovely lady from the local museum, Beverly, and uh, she, she was expecting us and she was a wonderful um, conduit, I guess, to, to speak to some of the local, other local townspeople who were feeling um, very bruised and, um, and needed to be reassured that we weren't there for um, reasons other than offering support. Uh, Natalie, if someone's watching this video uh, from home and they have an object that's damaged by fire, um, is there anything that they can do with it? Can they treat it like we would treat objects at the museum? Oh, Penny, that's such a good question. Um, we, it wouldn't be appropriate for conservation at the NMA to recommend how people treat their own objects at home. That's something that can be a bit risky. As you can see in the video that we just watched, the objects aren't the same anymore because they've been through this experience and they could also be quite hazardous. So some of the things you can do, we've got some really good resources on online on the internet. So we can actually attach some of those links um, after this, um, if that works. Um, but um, the thing that you can do at home is to really think about the story that your object is now telling because it's been through this experience, it's significant to you, it's important to you, um, is the experience that it's been through now part of its story and how does that, what, what do you want to use it for now, how is it functional anymore, you know, that kind of question. Just remember that, you know, this is your stuff and it's your significant stuff so it's probably going to be quite an emotional process for you to have to do this. but. At the museum, we have these conversations about why objects are important, and that's what we call a significance assessment here. And in conservation, we do a condition assessment, and together, the significance assessment and the condition assessment make up our treatment proposals. So you can have those conversations if you choose to engage a conservator, because they will know 
how that object's changed. They can then talk to you about why it's important to you and work out a treatment proposal so that they can help you um, with your objects. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm personally interested, you mentioned in the video an ultrasonic gelatin treatment, which sounds like superhero jelly. Um, <laughs> how do you generate an ultrasonic gelatin treatment to consolidate something on an object? Oh, I'm going to give you a really silly answer. We use an ultrasonic mist generator. <laughs> um, okay, so instead of, I mean, we want a really ultrasonic mist and that is something that's incredibly fine. So we know that steam is incredibly fine, but we don't want the heat. So it's a bit like a nebulizer um, that, you know, generates that really fine mist that you inhale, but no, um, but it's, it's a similar thing. It's vibrating and creates a really fine mist that way to get really into that um, consolidation treatment. Thank you so much. So the cup had a gelatin mist treatment on it. Oh, yeah. Um, what have you done or have you done anything to the strainer and the teapot that we saw in the pre-record? Um, surprisingly, no. So the cup was actually prepared for a previous exhibition and it needed a few of these things to stop it kind of becoming airborne. Um, but for the uh, teapot and the dish and the, um, strain, uh, the vegetable steamer that you saw in the video, we might actually decide to do nothing. Um, we've kind of had those conversations and we might choose to do a risk assessment and instead support and isolate them inside a showcase so that you know if we open the showcase we're not going to generate a whole heap of dust it just might be a little box so you'll have to come and see what we do to those thank you so much um so just before we start to head into the audience questions which i'm noting are starting to come in um can i ask libby why is it important that the museum collects objects that relate to bushfires well, as we know, bushfires are a perennial part of the Australian experience, of course, bushfires around the world, and as we're seeing in California at the moment, but um, here in Australia, and I guess especially on the East Coast with, with the amount of um, bush that we have, many hundreds, if not thousands of people, every bushfire season um, have an experience with bushfire. But, you know, bushfires in this country have, uh, go back millennia and we know that First Nations people um, have, have a very intimate relationship with fire through um, cultural burns and um, managing the landscape in the way that they have and continue to, to do in caring for, for country. Um, but here at the museum, I guess, we deal with the really devastating um, impacts of bushfire, amongst other things, as, as we are doing with the 2019 and 2020 fires. Those fires, um, we've never seen we've never seen them on the scale that we have before, and it's really hard to make sense of that. Um, so in the present, the museum can tell stories and bear witness through the objects that we're collecting, but also, in, you know, in a hundred years' time, where strange as it may seem, you know, we, these things will be in the distant past, that the museum can still um, look after these objects and can continue to tell those stories um, so that people can make sense of what our very complex relationship with bushfire actually is. Uh, we've got a question coming in from Caroline on YouTube. Caroline would like to know, will these objects be used in an exhibition anytime soon? I might throw this at least initially to Natalie because I, I know that some of those objects are getting ready for an exhibition. They are, Penny, and yes. Um, so we have a uh, permanent gallery opening, uh, which we're calling Life in Australia Gallery. And that has a couple of modules that involve our bushfire objects that um, were in the previous uh, video. So we've got the Stromlo teacup, and we've also got those three objects from Marysville that are currently selected for that. Thank you. Um, now, Libby, there was also a particular collecting project around the 2019-2020 bushfires? That's right. We have here at the museum what we call a um, priority collecting project, which basically means that we identify a whole set of objects uh, relating to the 2019 and 20 bushfires, and we um, uh, deliberately collect around those. And we'll do that for at least the next 12 months. So uh, that will give us a chance. Uh, with COVID, we've uh, been unable to travel to a lot of the areas that we'd like to. 
but hopefully over the next 12 months we'll be able to travel to lots of the bushfire affected countries, um, sorry, states um, and areas and, um, and talk to people and collect stories. It's not just objects that we're collecting, it's um, film and lots of um, what we call digital collections as well. Um, and, and at the end of that we'll, we'll have a really great collection and we can then work out the best way to, to prepare those and to show them and exhibit them, whether it's online or on site or both. Uh, now, Natalie, you talked a little bit about this, but Cynthia from YouTube would like to know, how do you prepare objects for exhibition display? Ooh. I know that's a big question. That is a huge question. Cynthia, I'm not entirely sure that we can actually answer that right now, but just a brief background. There's a, I reckon there's a bit of a misconception that exhibition projects come together overnight, and they don't. They're so big. So it's a really large, um, kind of process involving lots of different departments, curators, designers, registrars, conservators, media, AV, like all of these fabulous, fabulous, knowledgeable people that we have. So from an, um, and did I say project managers? Oh, project managers. Um, so yeah, it's a really, really, really complex um, thing that can take months, even years. So, um, but from an objects perspective, we get an object list and we then go through our documentation procedures and from a conservation perspective, we then work out what needs to be treated and then we look at how we're going to mount it and how it's going to be displayed and all of that comes together eventually and it ends up in the galleries. But that might be something that maybe we could keep talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, M Blaney would like to know, are you collecting oral histories about the fires too? Particularly linked to the objects that you collected. Libby, I'm going to throw this one to you. Absolutely. Um, we are collecting oral histories and that's a great question because relating to some of those pottery items belonging to Daniel Lafferty that you saw in the video, uh, while I was at Daniel's place collecting the, uh, the pottery, I also did do um, a good half hour interview with Daniel, which forms part of that collection and helps to give us a more rounded story uh, on another visit to Tumbarumba, as I mentioned before, we did oral histories with um, just about all the members of the Blaze Aid team that was working out there, as well as the property owner on whose um, property they were fixing fences. So absolutely, oral history is a critical part of what we're doing. Yep. Uh, conservation question. This one's from Alison Reed. Uh, Alison's wondering how long are fire affected objects able to be on display? That's a really good question, Alison. We have quite a few different procedures that we look at in terms of object display. We look at structural integrity. We look at whether light is gonna change an object, um, particularly if we've got something that's, I'm gonna use a museum term, quite fugitive in terms of color, which means that exposed to light, it might fade and therefore its significance or its story might be affected by that. Uh, we look at, um, again, another conservation term, inherent vice. So if something's made of plastic and is something that will degrade over time, like, you know, lounge foam when you, it gets all a bit crunchy over time. So all of those things um, go into us making a decision about display time. So it could be anywhere from six months um, up until 10 years, like some things can be on display for a very long time. So it just depends on what they're made of. But I would say with, um, say for instance, the dish and the cup, um, they're actually quite stable in terms of um, how they're made up and what's on them now. So I would say that they can be on display for a number of years. Stephen Brown, our first Facebook question. Hi Stephen, thanks for joining us. Uh, as local community brigade, social media was a significant platform uh, during the fires. Uh, he would like to know, are we collecting that digital history as well, Libby? Hi Stephen, great question. And absolutely we are. We very soon after the fire started, created a special um, Facebook page called Fridge Door Fire Stories, based around the Bungendore Fridge, which was one of the first objects uh, that we, we collected and that enabled uh, a number of fire brigade members and members of the public people affected by the fires to post all sorts of material and there's in fact some of the footage that you saw at the start of that video was from uh, one of those, those people. So that Facebook page is still open and we welcome uh, anyone to, to go on and post their material. 
um, because it, it's a really important part of documenting that history. And those Facebook pages um, eventually will be archived and kept, um, I guess, as another form of collection item. So yeah. David S. Hi, David. He's one of our frequent viewers. I think he jumps on and asks a question every time. It's always nice to have you. <laughs> he would like to know, are conservation techniques such as the gelatin mist a long-term solution, Natalie? They can be, and sometimes not so much. So the, when we, this is a very complicated question, David, and I'm really sorry that I'm just gonna give a very simple answer, but I think we might revisit this one. Um, they are treatments that we really do look at how they're gonna affect the object over time. And we really try to make our treatments things that are minimally interventive and as reversible as we can make them and within our code of ethics. So um, I think I'm, I, I could waffle on about that for quite a while actually. So I might just leave that one there. All right, uh, the bushfire items, are they donated or do we fossick? to see what can be found. How do you get permissions? This is from Rosalind on YouTube. So Libby. Yes, thanks Rosalind. It's a really interesting question about how museums acquire things and we do it through all sorts of means. Donation is a big part of it. So uh, the payphone, for example, I approached Telstra and asked that given that the phone box and the phone was no longer working, would they be prepared to donate? And they absolutely agreed. Uh, often we'll target. Um, so in the case of the phone box, we had actually seen via social media that it was no longer working. So that was a targeted collecting. Often people will approach us and we've had a number of people come to us and say, we've got these bushfire affected objects, would, would you like them? And we assess each offer on its merits, of course. Occasionally we, we buy things as well, artworks in particular. So it's a very varied process that we go through. And it takes, it takes a while. <laughs> uh, no fossicking, Rosalind. <laughs> We're coming to the end of the program, but we do still have time for a couple more questions. So uh, do get in, keep asking. If we don't get to your question, we will respond in the comments below. So make sure that they're posted publicly if you're on YouTube uh, so that we don't lose them when the live stream ends. Louise Scott on Facebook would like to know, are we considering an online exhibition perhaps of photographs or stories for those who cannot travel? Libby, I'm gonna throw this to you. <laughs> yes, um, so as I mentioned before, our collecting project around bushfire um, objects and stories is running for a long time. But over that period, we know that people are keen to hear these stories before we perhaps get a chance to do a really big exhibition. And so we do plan to, um, put some of these and photograph them really beautifully and put them online and the stories online as, as we collect them. Because, you know, as we know, lots of people can't travel and can't come to the museum. So it's a great way to share the information. Um, we'll also have a new website starting up soon where people will be able to post their own stories, their own film and their own photos relating to their bushfire experiences. So stay tuned on the museum's social media platforms to, um, to keep an eye out for that. That will be coming in a couple of months time. Uh, we have a question from Deb. Have we ever done a comparative exhibition with another country's bushfire affected objects? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, Nat, Libby, do either of you have any idea about that one? I'm not sure. No, I don't no. know. I haven't been at the museum for a terribly long time, and so I'm not sure if we've done that. Um, it's a fantastic I, it's, idea, It's a great though. question, and mm. something perhaps we'll table for our next yeah. bushfire collecting Thank you for the meeting. idea. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what is the oldest bushfire related object that the museum has. Libby, I'm going to throw that to you. Yeah, look, as far as I know, um, it's a fire cart, a horse drawn fire cart called the Merryweather, uh, which came from the UK in, I think, the early 1800s and was used in Tasmania to, to fight bushfires. So that's a really old and really beautiful. It's bright red, so it's, um, it's a pretty impressive bushfire related object. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the Merryweather cart. It's yeah. quite beautiful. Yeah. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our live stream. Uh, but before we head off, I just wanted to ask a very particular question for you, Natalie. Uh, if someone watching the live stream at home has fire affected objects that they would like to conserve, how do they go about contacting a conservator? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, in Australia, 
Conservators have a professional organisation called the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials, which is the AICCM, and there are other bodies in other countries that perform a similar function and on their website which we will link to you there are a list of conservators in private practice that you might be able to engage with yeah well we have one last question coming in from shane on facebook for smaller regional museums trying to collect their own regional fire history what advice do you have in terms of what to collect or avoid i'm going to start with libby Yes, good question Shane. Um, I guess my main point to make would be to make sure that you that the people are really comfortable in donating and, and really willing to, to donate their objects. Most fire affected objects, people have a very personal connection to them. So make sure you have full permissions um, and also that you can, that you're sure that you can look after things properly. You need to have um, conditions that aren't too damp or too hot or too cold to be able to look after things and that you can have a really good keep a really good record of them as well you need to be able to catalog them in some way but I'm sure there are objects that are affected in a way which from your point of view that um, people need to be wary of as well. Yeah just be really careful with the hazards that can be involved in bushfire collected um, bushfire affected collection objects um, yeah that's probably the biggest piece of advice that I can give. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you both very much for joining me for Live at the Museum today. It's been really great having you and mm -hmm. chatting away. And thank you everybody for joining us, whether you were on YouTube or Facebook Live. Uh, we've had a really nice time this afternoon. For those of you watching on YouTube, you may want to subscribe to our channel. Uh, and for those of you on Facebook, you might like to turn on live notifications so that you get a notification when we will next be live, which is a handy segue to our next program. On Thursday, the 29th of October, we're going to be talking about Australia and the Olympics with curator Lena Hall. Uh, we have an Olympic display on in the Gandel Atrium at present that celebrates 20 years since the Sydney 2000 Olympics. So please do join us for that. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month.